today, a helicopter operates from CRA's ship Craystar, where men live and work for months on end as they move along new coasts searching for minerals. Welcome to Exploration Radio. That audio you just heard is from the documentary called For Tomorrow, made in 1966. And it is talking about a ship called Craystar, used by the mining company CRA, which has now become Rio Tinto. Craystar was an acronym. The four letters of the name, C-R-A-E, stood for CRA Exploration. And while the last four are pretty self-explanatory. We're starting off our second season with this story because... Well, to put it simply, this is a story that Steve and I have been obsessing about for a while now. A lot of questions came into our mind when we first heard about the Craystar. Why would a mining company use a ship to explore? Well, maybe I can understand the ship part when you're working in the Pacific Islands, but why would they have a helicopter on it? What type of exploration programs were they running? What was it like working on this boat? And ultimately the real important question, was all of this effort worthwhile in the end? Did it accomplish what it set out to do? We love this story. It is a story about ingenuity, how to do something innovative, how to be bold, but also be calculated in how you do it. And maybe most importantly, how to think outside the box to come up with an elegant solution to a problem. This is the story of a ship called Craystar. Now to tell this story, we needed some help. My name is David McKenzie. I'm a geologist. I uh, uh, studied in Scotland and I came to Australia in 1961 as an exploration geologist and went in 1966. I was involved with the Craystar. Uh, do you mind explaining what the Craystar was? The MV Craystar was a small ship owned by CRA Exploration and it was fitted with a helicopter pad on the deck and uh, carried a helicopter which was launched to carry out geochemical stream sediment sampling searching for porphyry copper deposits in the Pacific Islands, particularly in Papua New Guinea. And uh, well, I'll explain later the, the, the whole background as to how that came about. The story begins with CRA, a mining company that was born out of the merger between Consolidated Zinc and Rio Tinto in 1962 and became Consink Rio Tinto of Australia, or CRA. And what was CRA doing at this time? Behind such prospecting work is Consink Rio Tinto Exploration, whose head office is in Melbourne. CRA is one of Australia's largest mining companies. It produces lead, zinc, copper, iron, uranium, and aluminium. Under the leadership of the chairman, Sir Morris Morby, and directed by Haddon King... Wait, let me interject here for a minute. Remember that name, Haddon King? He was the head of CRA Exploration at the time the Craystar program was initiated, and he plays a pretty important part in this story. Now let's get back to the documentary. And directed by Haddon King, CRA Exploration sends geologists all over Australia to search for other deposits for other types of metals for new mines must always be found. The latest discovery is the iron ore deposit at Mount Tom Price in the Hammersleys. Some years ago, CRA started to search for worthwhile deposits of low-grade copper. Beginning in eastern Queensland, the search extended into New Guinea. Today, the exploration team is continuing its work in the Solomon Islands on Bougainville. When this documentary was filmed in the 1960s, we were only a few years removed from the company having discovered Mount Tom Price, an iron ore deposit that ranks as one of the largest in the world. Mount Tom Price was a company maker, and the success of finding it was a key step in the development of the Craystar program. That discovery led to the CRA board having faith in Haddon King and his exploration team. Without that discovery, I'm not sure CRA exploration would have had the freedom to do the things they did and there probably would not have been the appetite to do things like Craystar. The fact that CRA had moved to the Pacific Islands looking for copper by around the mid-1960s sets the scene for the Craystar program. 
there were a number of developments that had to take place before a program like Craystar was even possible. Without these pieces, the puzzle could not have been completed. Here is Dave McKenzie again to tell us what those key developments were. There were three, three real strands to the story before the sort of real action of the Craystar ship itself. The first was the development of stream sediment geochemistry. Now, in the late 1950s, Professor Webb and Dr. Toombs of the Royal School of Mines in London, they developed wet uh, analytic techniques to determine roughly and rapidly in the field things like the copper, zinc, and molybdenum content of the fine fractions of stream sediments. Now, the potential of this was that you could rapidly narrow the target areas for exploration by tracing the uh, stream sediments upstream to wherever the mineral deposit was uh, occurring. Now, some of you out there might not know what stream sediment sampling is. Well, it is a relatively simple concept. The basic premise of the technique revolves around sampling sediment sitting at the bottom of rivers and streams. Why? Because the sediment along the bottom of a stream comes from the erosion of rocks further up the stream. So by sampling and analyzing the sediment for minute traces of, say, copper at the mouth of a stream, can tell us whether any rocks up the stream have any copper in them. The real benefit of stream sediment sampling is that it can be a very quick way to highlight which streams are likely sourcing sediment from an area that might be prospective for copper, or for that matter, any other element you might be interested in. As a technique, Stream sediment sampling is used commonly in areas that get a lot of rainfall and have a lot of topography. So take the islands in the southwest Pacific, where CRA was looking for copper at that time. Well, these islands are in the tropics, so they get plenty of rainfall, and they have quite a lot of topography, like hills, mountains, and valleys. So for CRA working in these islands at the time, stream sediment sampling would have been the perfect technique to quickly determine which areas were prospective for copper. And although this technique is quite commonplace nowadays in mineral exploration, in the early 1960s, this was quite a novel and untested technique. And CRA was hoping to develop it for much wider use as part of the exploration programs. In 1960, before I came to Australia, Haddon King was the director of exploration for the Conzinc Company, Consolidated Zinc Company. And he was keen to uh, support and try new methods and he had strong board backing to do that. Now, in 1960, Haddon King and the chief geologist, Clem Knight, they planned to hire Webb and Toombs from London as advisors because they were planning a geochemical program in 1961 searching in East Queensland and parts of the Northern Territory for porphyry copper deposits. Now, with guidance from Webb and Toombs, Ken Phillips was selected to set up a mobile, what we call the geochemical circus. It had a a lab, a mess, and sleeping caravans, all vehicle-based. Two young graduate geologists, Tony Warren and Tony Hope, did much of the legwork and the field tests, while a fellow called Stan Burnick did the confirmatory assay in the laboratory caravan. So let me interject there for a bit. So did CRA have any history of doing stream sediment sampling before this uh, period? Not really that I'm aware of. So it was a new technology to CRA exploration at that time. And did you know any other competitors or any other companies that were doing these surveys at that time? I, I don't know. I wasn't really in a position to know much about what other companies were doing. But would it be fair to say that this wasn't a widely used technique at that time? No, it wasn't widely used. I think that's fair to say, yes. Let me elaborate on the two main parts of the story here. CRA was not just trying to adopt Webb and Tomb's new technique of sampling and analyzing the sediment out of the streams. The real key was that CRA was also trying to develop ways that the analysis part of this new technique could be completed rapidly and in the field. This was the so-called mobile geochem circus. Being able to know whether a sample had anomalous amounts of copper or gold or whatever else only a short time after the sample was collected in the field had huge potential to assist exploration teams. Normally, exploration teams completing sampling programs had to send their samples to a geochemical laboratory for analysis and wait for the results to come back. This process could take anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of months. 
Imagine if you could find out the day after you collected a sample, whether it had any anomalous amounts of copper or not. This is what CRA was working on. So how successful was CRA's copper exploration programs in Queensland and Northern Territory? Now, the method in North Queensland uh, identified all base metal workings, so there was some confidence that the thing could be applied, but there was nothing very uh, outstanding in that work. So the, the technique had led them into the things, but the results themselves were disappointing. We knew at that point that this, uh, you know, the technique worked reasonably, but we didn't have very good results. Maybe we weren't picking the, the, right, uh, the right areas to work in. So now, this was the, the first program that CRA ever ran? Yes, that was the first geochemical program. So can you give an idea? I mean, extreme sediment sampling is quite routine practice nowadays for porphyry copper exploration. So can you comment on like what the difference between, say, stream sediment versus other techniques at that time would have been? Was it cheaper? Was it faster? In, in theory, yes, it was cheaper and faster, and you could eliminate low-grade areas relatively quickly and focus on better grade possibilities. So as a way of focusing the area that you wanted to work exactly. in, it, this was exactly. probably the best way. It was a way of focusing. So that's very basically what the geochemical slant of the thing was. So the first development that made a program like Craystar possible was the development of the stream sediment sampling technique and its rapid deployment in the field. Although CRA may not have developed the technique, credit should be paid to them for adopting it with the specific aim of setting it up as a fast, mobile technique to allow them to quickly identify areas that were prospective for whatever they were exploring for at that time. This would become an important aspect of the role that the Craystar program was to play later on. Now the area containing the deposits must be located. This is done by making a thorough examination of the geology of the surrounding country. The prospectors start at the mouth of the river. Then they work their way up to the various junctions of the streams where they make tests and take samples. By a process of elimination, slowly and surely the rough general boundaries of the prospect are established. But always the geologists are on the lookout for any mineral which might be of use. Chance still plays a part in mining. The rocks are carefully examined and ultimately all the information that the geologists are gathering will be pieced together to give a fuller geological understanding of the area. Now what was the second development that made the Craystar program possible? Let's go back to Dave to find out. What intervened then in 1962, the Consink Company and the Rio Tinto Company merged, and that formed CRA, Consink Rio Tinto of Australia. And by descent from that, we had CRA Exploration or CRAE, which is the first part of Craystar. What happened at that merger was Rio were strong in cash, and that was merged with the Consink, which had strong in project ideas and concepts to follow up. The benefit of the merger was shown almost right away with the discovery of the Mount Tom Price iron deposit very shortly after the merger, and incidentally, that was using helicopters for rapid uh, traversing and observation. It may seem like the next key development that enabled CRA to carry out a program like Craystar was the use of helicopters in their exploration programs. In reality, that was the third key development. We'll get to that one. So what was the second key development? It was a discovery of a deposit called Panguna, after CRA made the move to start exploring in the Pacific Islands. You'll often hear Panguna called Bougainville. That is simply because the deposit was found on the island of Bougainville. In the Solomon Islands, just south of the equator, lies Bougainville. To this tropical island, still largely untouched by the outside world, Consink Rio Tinto Australia sends geologists to search for minerals. The story on that was Ken Phillips and his people continued their geochemical circus in eastern Queensland and they were running a bit out of steam by 1963. 
And Ken had been thinking about, uh, he thought a better chance to look for porphyry copper deposits, which was the aim, was to look in the Pacific Islands somewhere, especially volcanic islands, you know, like Bougainville, where, in fact, some government reports as early as 1936, but also in 1939 and 1960, referring to a copper occurrence and a small-scale gold mine on the island of Bougainville. So he suggested exploring there. At first, management, for some reason, dis discouraged him, perhaps because of the big commitment then to the iron ore. But Ken persisted. So management then gave way, and the title was secured over the central Bougainville in early 1964. So can you comment a little bit about what you knew about PNG before you went there? PNG was pretty frontier in those times. What? <laughs> Almost nothing. <laughs> Perfect. That's why you went there. Yeah. Uh, almost nothing. Um, well, that's I, I personally knew almost nothing. There was some knowledge of it within the company because our chief geologist, Clem Knight, had escaped from the Japanese uh, during the war and had done some coast watching activity spotting on the Japanese. So he, he had some experience of New Guinea conditions. Nobody else did. So now, did you think that was, uh, when you were sent there, did you think that was a crazy idea, going to uh, these islands? No, no. I just uh, accepted that we went all over the place, and that was a regular thing to do. As a field geologist, an exploration geologist, you went where the opportunities were. Well, you may be wondering why the Pacific Islands were a better place to find a copper deposit, particularly a porphyry copper deposit, than, say, Queensland or Northern Territory. Well, the answer lies in how porphyry deposits actually form. These type of deposits are usually associated with volcanic rocks, or rocks that form as a direct product of volcanic activity. And if you consider that in the southwest Pacific, most of the islands there are part of volcanic chains, having formed as a result of volcanic activity on the sea floor, then it stands to reason that these islands would likely host a mineral deposit, often associated with volcanic rocks. And that is exactly what had occurred at Bougainville. Dave mentioned that Ken found a few old reports that talked about copper and gold having previously been discovered on the island of Bougainville. Well, porphyry copper deposits often have some gold associated with them as well. So the fact that both were occurring on the island was a good sign that there was likely a porphyry deposit there. It just made sense for Ken and CRA to start their search for copper there. <laughs> Before the war, other prospectors had come to this rugged country, where to travel a short distance, men must walk for hours. They came looking for gold. And years ago, amongst these almost inaccessible hills, one small gold mine once operated. Copper is often found with gold. And CRA geologists, reading the old reports, came to Bougainville with their specialized knowledge and modern equipment, hoping to find copper or other mineral deposits. Ken's team started off their work at Bougainville by doing the same stream sediment sampling techniques they had been using in Australia, and they immediately had success, finding anomalous copper and gold all around the Panguna deposit. So how did the results at Panguna compare to those they had in Australia? So these results were quite an order of magnitude better than any in the previous three years' work. So they knew they were onto something. At this time that Ken went into PNG, were there any other companies exploring in PNG? Yes, there were, and there were companies who were sniffing around, one might say, who were sort of interested. And, and, and we believe that there were some companies who knew about the government reports about the island of Bougainville and the Panguna area. But, but Ken had secured title to it. Is the story that the title was held in Ken's name true? That's true, yes. Because uh, in the hurry to apply for it, he applied himself before the company applied. And there was a bit of a complicated thing with transferring the title from him to the company during the process. That's quite true. At, at any rate, it didn't take them very long to say, look, we've just got to get a drill rig in here. It was so much better than anything they'd seen before. So very rapidly, they organized a drill rig with a helicopter to move it. And uh, the early results of drill holes were something like oh, 100 meters of 1% copper, which again was way above anything that they'd found before. 
and very quickly that meant they were dedicated to an evaluation project with multiple drills. They knew they were up for big expenditure to get this thing sorted out, that it really was a viable uh, proposition. So at that point, our strategic position was we knew the geochemical signature for a major porphyry copper system in the conditions of Papua New Guinea, but our serious competitors who were around, like Kennecott and MIM, Madiza Mines, and Anaconda and others, they did not know the signature of that style and quality of deposit. Now, how then could we maintain an advantage and preempt the competition? The discovery of Panguna was obviously a great result for CRA, and the fact that it was turning out to be a big enough deposit that the company could consider developing it into a mine was even better news. But success in mineral exploration brings with it the attention of all your competitors, and pretty soon you're the hunted. Companies are trying whatever means they can to figure out the secret to your success. And they are relentless. So CRA had to move fast before others caught up to them in the Pacific Islands. Two geologists, Ian Witcher and Bill Patterson, they were sent off to reconnoiter several islands off New Ireland in a small workboat. And they got negative results for copper, and it was a very laborious business. At the same time, I was sent to Guadalcanal in the Solomons to follow up some reports of signs of copper there. And there was a similar story, essentially negative results after an awful lot of walking and climbing and months of activity. So it became quite clear to us that going using workboats and foot slogging weren't the answer to rapidly reconnoitering for other deposits. CRA's aim to test as many islands around Bougainville, and generally in the southwest Pacific, for another major copper deposit, was not an arbitrary one, nor was it misguided. Before the company decided to sink billions of dollars in developing a mine at Panguna, They needed to know whether there was another deposit in the area that was possibly bigger, or maybe better located, or was maybe cheaper to develop into a mine. But as Dave mentioned, although CRA had the intention to test as many of the other islands around Bougainville in as short a time as possible, the reality was that they were just too slow in doing it. Using traditional methods of sending geologists out on foot through the jungles and on small boats up and down rivers, was not going to be the way to quickly answer the question, was there a better copper deposit to develop in the area than Panguna? They needed a new way, and that turned out to be the Craystar program. But before the Craystar program could be set up, there was one last development to be made. With the arrival of the helicopters at Bougainville, CRA makes possible a speedy and more economical investigation of the Panguna prospect. In 15 minutes, the helicopter can fly in from the coast, across the forbidding mountains to the little camps beyond, carrying new parts for the machines, fuel and food for technicians and geologists. Before the helicopters, getting to the camp meant two hard days walking through the steep jungle country. A journey that was impossible for some of the men who were needed. The Rio Tinto side of the company in Tasmania had used helicopters around about 1960. But after the merger with Consolidated Zinc in 62, the helicopters were used quite a bit by by CRA Exploration, essentially to boost the rate of ground coverage in several key projects. I mentioned the search for iron ore in the Pilbara by the merged company uh, led very quickly after to discovery of Mount Tom Price iron ore deposit. And that was done by geologists mapping and sampling and traversing and being and leapfrogging, two or three geologists leapfrogging each other with a helicopter connecting in between and taking them on to the next location, which was a very quick and effective tool because Mount Tom Price was essentially found by mapping it outcropped at the surface. Helicopters are now, again, quite commonplace in these type of programs. At that time, like helicopters were a relatively new thing. We're talking about the early 60s. They were very new. And in fact, technically, the machines we used, the helicopters we used, were ex-Korean War, Bell D-1. We we had a D-1 with a a chassis number that signified it had been in the Korean War. It was that low when there were only hundreds of helicopters around anywhere. The rotor blades were made of laminated wood. And out of this (laughs) 
I would describe it as a sort of plywood flywood. <laughs> the rotor blades. I knew that because we had an accident in one and smashed it up and there were splinters everywhere. You even imagine wood splinters connected with a helicopter accident. And by 1965, of course, we had a much better helicopter, the Bell G3B1, and they were much better suited to hot and high kind of situations. It is worth mentioning again that this was the 1960s and helicopters were relatively untested in mineral exploration or actually in any civilian or commercial use. So you have to pay credit to CRA for taking the plunge in adopting a new technique and developing it for use within the company, similar to what they did with stream sediment sampling. But it was not all smooth sailing with helicopters. Well, the thing about talking of helicopters is they're very fragile, a very fragile mechanism, really. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of problems with our local crews training them in safety. There was one camp in, in the middle of New Britain, uh, a long way from anywhere. There was a field hand, uh, a local field hand was putting rods onto the pannier at the side of the helicopter. And inadvertently, he forgot and lifted the rod up into the air, into the rotating rotor blades. The fieldy was thrown to the ground, the rod was bent in a right angle, and the machine was only just flyable, and it was technically grounded. And we were stuck way up in the jungle somewhere without a helicopter until the DCA, Department of Civil Aviation, inspectors passed the installation of a new blade, which had to be flown in to a local airstrip. So the, uh, we stranded <laughs> geologists weren't very happy with that. Sometimes we did sampling in the streams or in the hilly mountainous sort of country, covered in, in tropical jungle. And the pickups of the geologists at sampling points on the, on the rivers, they often required a vertical descent into the riverbed, which might be very bouldery. And the pilot couldn't land, but he rested one skid on a boulder or a quick in and out by the geologist. And even in those positions, sometimes the rotor clearance of the canopy was only one or two meters either side. Wow. So he'd take the thing down vertically, you know, 50 meters, creek bed, and then power vertically up. You could do that with a Bell G3B1, you see. It was all pretty hairy. Dave, one question I have is, was there ever a push in the company that maybe we shouldn't use helicopters, that they're too risky? You see, these, these people like uh, Haddon King and Clem Knight, they were very forward-looking. They were all for trying new techniques. The only thing that was a deterrent was the cost. They were very expensive to operate, but of course you could cover the ground much more early and get more results quicker. In the Papua New Guinea jungle, it allowed the geologist to take as many samples in a day as he might on foot take in a week or several weeks. So that was balanced against the cost of using, using helicopters. When you hear the story unfold like this, the tendency may be to think that it was all an accident that a program like Craystar came about. Oh no! It wasn't an accident. It was all. It was all a staged uh, progress, uh, making the thing more efficient and more effective, and 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 keeping out the competition because it was very competitive business, as you know, in mineral exploration. So the stage is finally set. Over the early part of the 1960s, CRA developed a rapid field-based geochemical sampling and analytical technique. They got comfortable using helicopters as a way of assisting their exploration programs and they found that they needed a rapid and more effective way of exploring the islands in the southwest Pacific. Combine all three and you get the Craystar, a ship that had an onboard geochemical laboratory that worked in tandem with the field sampling crews, a helipad so it could allow a helicopter to be used by the sampling crews, and it was able to tackle any logistical problem that working in the islands threw at it. The ship was the embodiment of an idea, born out of sustained innovation and experimentation with a clear eye towards what problem the company was trying to solve. Cresta was exactly what CRA was looking for. As to the ship, the Craystar, which is CRA, -E, CRA Exploration Plus Star, somebody had a bright idea to name it the Craystar, um, I really don't know whose idea it was to equip a ship and a helicopter, but I suspect Haddon King, the director, and Ken Phillips between them, uh, I think were the prime movers of this sort of lateral thinking. Haddon himself, he was always saying, what next? He was prepared to try new ideas of concepts, and he had backing at high level in the board. Now, in this particular instance, a fellow called Clary Byrne 
was a CRA director at the time, and he was an ex-Royal Navy captain with a lot of maritime contacts. It was he who was instrumental in locating a Japanese tuna boat. It was stranded on a reef off Fiji. Now, this ship was 37 meters long. That's 120 feet long. It was 300 tons burden. And it was purchased, I think, for about 25,000 pounds, which would be the price you might pay in those days for a Rolls Royce. So it was cheap at the price. It was salvaged. It was registered in Port Vila in the New Hebrides, which is now called Vanuatu. And it was fitted with cabins at the rear of the ship for 10 people. And the roof of the cabins was a helipad, which the helicopter could land on the ship, which was only about 10 by 5 meters in area. It was a tiny little thing. Now, th those cabins, they were to accommodate geologists, the helicopter crew, a chemist, and technical field assistants. In the hold of the old tuna boat, they installed an atomic absorption spectrometer unit to do assaying on the boat. And that meant very rapid assay turnaround, and which meant that the follow-up, if there was anything anomalous came up, we well, could go and check it out very quickly and effectively using a helicopter. In the laboratory that CRA has established there, the chemist tests numerous samples sent from beyond the rugged mountains, where day after day the prospectors continue their work. Small portions of the soil from the riverbeds are weighed and made into solution. A reagent is added, and as the liquid turns purple, the chemist recognizes the presence of copper and the quality of the sample. Under the cabins at the stern, there was a provision for missing kitchen office facilities there. The mast had to be cut in two and hinged to allow the uh, helicopter to take off. So every time helicopter take on landed, the mast had to be lowered down. Uh, so that's how the Craystar operated. And it went round the islands, anchoring near the coast and people ferrying off inland to the sample sites and the different drainages coming off the spine of the islands. Now, obviously, just as important as the equipment on the ship were the people that worked on it. And the first skipper on the ship, he was an ex-pilot uh, from Gladstone. Uh, Archie MacArthur was his name, and he was very noted because he regularly had work. He had his gin and tonic when he said, the sun's over the yard arm. Time for G&T, the sun's over the yard arm. And there was a mate, uh, an engineer, who I think was uh, Fijian, and there were up to eight local crew and field hands. Usually there were two or three geologists on board the ship, and they stayed there for two or three months. And sometimes there were rostered replacements from other offices from CRA exploration because they had to have some leave uh, uh, for the regulars. And um, the geologists on board, they, the, the ship moved from anchorage to anchorage along the island as they moved inland to, to sample up to the, the ridge. And, of course, this, people got very affectionate for the ship, and they no, knew it as the cray pot. Its nickname was the Cray Pot. <laughs> and <laughs> and, uh, and they did a lot of fishing off that ship too. They had a great, huge, enormous ice chest. It was never empty from fish that could be caught overboard. Frank Hughes, the famous Frank Hughes, who was in the team that found Mount Tom Price, uh, he led that group the first time year around. And uh, Ian uh, Witcher was there as a geologist with him. And Rudy Claridge was also there, a geologist with him. Rudy, in fact, earlier had been with me for a while in Guadalcanal, doing everything by foot and slogging. But he graduated onto the, onto the Craystar. And we had a, a chemist, was a chap called Edgar Mutsenikus, who was a, a Lithuanian, whose uh, English was broken, but his pigeon was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the more important thing, Dave. He's, he spoke several languages. He could communicate with anybody. And uh, the pilots were very skillful because they kept landing on that little helipad on the deck of the ship and uh, needed a lot of judgment, especially if the vessel was moving. But on the other hand, the ship could easily steam into the wind, which that assisted on takeoff. Uh, I don't think we ever lost any machine over the side. But, you know, on a 10 by 5 area to land a helicopter is pretty tricky stuff. Can you talk a little bit about the life 
on the boat? I mean, you obviously didn't spend a lot of time on the boat. You were a little bit on the periphery. Life on the boat was pretty comfortable. There was a we had a cook on board, and you got uh, three meals a day, or you got something to eat when you were out struggling through the jungle in the middle of the day. Uh, you know, and we ate very well, and uh, accommodation, and there were showers, and uh, there was a real um, sense of camaraderie and achievement, and so on. You know, socially on the ship, the people who worked there together really made bonds that stayed with them for the rest of their lives. And like I say, it certainly beat living under under tarpaulin in the bush and eating tin fish and that sort of thing <laughs> and rice. <laughs> and let's not forget that you also got uh, gin and tonics on the boat, the most important thing of all. So. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So, Dave, how was it working with governments in these islands at that time? Was it a challenge? Uh, well, the government couldn't be more helpful in terms of granting titles and smoothing the way. They were so keen on, on development for Papua New Guinea. We got every encouragement. And the geological community then was a fairly small one. And um, some of the senior uh, people in PNG had worked with our geologists. You know, and people like Clem Knight knew them all anyway. We got lots and lots of encouragement from the government in terms of granting titles and having reasonable terms and conditions for the work requirements and so on. We got a very good deal. Seems like life on the Craystar would have been full of adventure. It was one of the reasons why Steve and I were attracted to this story. There was no shortage of stories to go around. Dave filled us in on a few. There were quite a few humorous stories about this uh, ship. At uh, one time, there was a jetty, and they moved, moored alongside the jetty at high tide. And the deckhands put the, uh, the mooring ropes much too tight onto the piles on, along the jetty. And when the tide went down, the boat started to list very heavily because it was on, on the rubbing strip along the side of the boat, it was hooked up on the piles. And we didn't know whether the piles would break first or the boat would tip, o- tip over into the water. Fortunately, the tide came back in again before anything serious happened. But there were all these little, little dramas. One other story about the Craystar was that the ship was coming back with supplies and things overnight one night. And the, the skipper, was uh, he was asleep in his bunk. Enormous thundering and crashing under the ship. And he jumped up and he yelled to the mate who was at the wheel, hard a port. And so the mate turned hard a port. And about a minute or so later, there was another crashing and thundering. And what had happened was the ship had run onto a coral reef, which was a circular shape. So, you know, it, <laughs> there was one big bump to get into as I said, the reef, turn left, and another big bump to get out, out again. <laughs> And so they never let the skipper down for that story. In fact, it was said that at the end of the ship's career, when it was disposed of, uh, they reckoned the bottom plates were pretty thin. It had scraped on quite a number of reefs. Did you ever feel uh, unsafe when you were working with the Craystar in these programs? Uh, not, not at all. Well, you got accustomed to working with a helicopter and seeing things that way. There was one thing happened, uh, which was a bit hairy. Um, On one occasion, Ian and Rudy had been landed at a certain spot to do the sampling up diverging streams. And uh, they were both there together. When Ian climbed up over a rock, he slipped and fell into a big pool of water and hit his head on the way down and uh, didn't come up. And Rudy, uh, who's not much of a swimmer at all, dived in and managed to pull him ashore. And they had, to, they had to wait till the helicopter came round again to take him out and patch him up. There were hazardous things uh, like that in that sort of work. Can you talk a little bit about how hard it would have been to do this exploration without Craystar? What are we talking about? Would it involve more people, more money? Well, it would have been very laborious. It would have been very slow. Uh, you wouldn't have covered the ground at anything like the rate that we were able to do it. That slowness just brought costs behind them. You know, being really slow was costly, and doing it quickly was expensive at the time, but in the long run was more efficient, much more efficient. And this efficiency that the ship provided to the CRA exploration teams went beyond just that they could collect samples and analyze them quickly in the field. The ship allowed the company to do much more than that. The ship really was a floating exploration camp, you see, particularly suited to the reconnaissance work and the fast turnaround of samples and quick follow-up. When the next stage came, once you had anomalies from the the sediment sampling, if you had then to auger 
or diamond drill, the ship was, of course, invaluable for supporting that sort of work because you could have your heavy equipment, whatever it was, fuel drums, drill rigs and so on, on the ship and then ferry them inland as to where the drill testing was going on. In fact, I was involved in 1966 in New Britain. I was following up with auger work, the 1965 stream sediment anomalies. So one year we got the stream sediment anomalies with the Craystar going through the islands. Next year with the Craystar we went and we took up augers and sampled them. And eventually, a year or so later, they were diamond drilled. Not with much success in terms of economics, but they were, they were tested to be, okay, not quite good enough. One point I wanted to make is I think it's fascinating you say that, you know, like one year you collect stream sediments and the other year you effectively have the results to test the targets and make a decision. Yeah. I mean, that's phenomenal in a place like the islands. That was in New Britain and New Britain's 300 kilometers long. So, you know, there's a fair area that was covered effectively in that way. So in the end, how much area did the Craystar end up covering in the Southwest Pacific? The sort of outcome was, after about three or four years, the Craystar had surveyed most of the Papua New Guinea islands, uh, you know, all of the well-known islands and a lot of little ones, you know, New Island, New Britain, Bougainville, and the Papua New Guinea mainland, the north coast of the mainland of Papua New Guinea, right up to the Arian Jaya border. They'd cruised around the Solomon Islands and Vanuatu and checked things out. It went through uh, several of the the Solomon Islands, Guadalcanal, uh, Isabel, various islands there, Manus Island. I'm not sure which ones it did in Vanuatu, but it it certainly explored down there as well. Uh, So it did this over a period of how many years? Well, the main part was, uh, so it started in 64, 65. The ship started from 65 and then went on. I think it had gone to Indonesia by about the end of the 60s, about five years. And eventually it went on to explore in Indonesia. And I don't really know anything about what happened then or when it was disposed of. Uh, that's about the story of the Star. Actually, that is only half the story of the Star. We now know that the project was born out of a necessity that CRA had. After the company made the discovery at Panguna, They wanted to try to stay ahead of their competitors in the Southwest Pacific. They wanted to maintain their first mover advantage. But as we've heard, the roots to the program were really laid much earlier when CRA started tinkering with different exploration techniques, like stream sediment sampling, like using helicopters, willing to go to areas that others did not want to, like Bougainville, and following up on ideas that others dared not to, like seeing the potential in using a ship as a floating exploration base. The Craystar program just represented the amalgamation of all these techniques and ideas, driven by the aim of being quick and effective. Now you may be asking yourself, how effective was the program in the end? In the next episode, we meet another member of the Craystar team. My name is Jacob Rebeck, uh, geologist. I worked in CRA exploration from 1970 to 2003. And what role did Jacob play in the Craystar program? In about 1971 or 72, General Manager Exploration Don Carruthers asked me to prepare a report in which I reviewed progress of exploration by other companies in areas that have been previously explored by the Craystar team. The General Manager Don Carruthers, he was concerned that uh, It was possible that Chrysler team has missed what later on uh, could become a valuable porphyry copper deposit. What was the answer that Jacob came up with? Well, tune in next week to find out. Exploration Radio is brought to you by Steve and Amad. Our producer and all-round go-to guy is Dan Hershowitz. Audio from the documentary For Tomorrow was kindly provided by Rio Tinto. This podcast is recorded at the Perth Music House. If you'd like to know more about Exploration Radio, check us out on explorationradio.com. Or you can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And as always, if you like this podcast, please review us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Until next time, let's keep exploring.